Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Reverend Ruman Moses James, and um, today's uh, topic is uh, Buddhism and uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, I thought it was an interesting topic, uh, being a cognitive behavioral therapist. Um, so I wanted to share some of the information that I've uh, researched and try to organize it in a way that I feel would be best best absorbed. So I'll load, load the uh, PowerPoint that I have here. So uh, the title for this discussion is uh, Overlaying the Lenses of Buddhism and Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Uh, we're looking at basically a practical relationship between the two. Uh, just to note the uh, the way that Buddhism is, is termed here uh, is, is looking at the practical aspect uh, as opposed to um, anything else. So uh, the goal here is looking at a connection between the two in terms of their um, observation and uh, empiricism in terms of helping others. Uh, and in particular here, we're looking at understanding and addressing suffering. So what I thought would be helpful was uh, to create some objectives here and um, outline it very specifically in terms of origin through application. So the uh, first part is about Buddhism and psychology origin. I'm pretty sure everyone is familiar with the origins of Buddhism, um, but this basically ties into uh, how they both more or less started around the same time, the, this way of thinking about human behavior. And then from there, we're looking at the uh, Buddhist lens or uh, Buddhist psychology. And again, like I said, the there's a, uh, I feel that when you look at comparing the two in a way or, or looking at even a contrast of the two, uh, the word Buddhist psychology seems to fit more in terms of um, making that connection. And then from there, we're looking at the cognitive behavioral lens. And then we're looking at suffering from both perspectives in terms of uh, Buddhist psychology and CBT. And we're looking at commonalities, three, basically. And then we're looking at the application piece in terms of addressing suffering. And then there's a uh, mini conclusion. All right, so in terms of um, just in general, uh, you know, the earliest documented cultural records suggest that people have been interested in observing and describing human behavior for a millennia. And this is both um, in terms of psychology and Buddhism. For psychology, it started with like the Greeks in terms of ancient Greek philosophy is born out of mythos and led to the blossoming of early psychology. In particular, the cognitive behavioral therapy, we're looking at Stoic philosophy and how that was the original philosophical inspiration. Now the basic theoretic or theoretical assumptions underlying rational psychotherapy, or one could argue, you know, just cognitive behavioral therapies in general, is that it's this insight from Stoic philosophy, right? That human beings are disturbed not by things, but the views they take on them. Right? And this is more so from Alice with uh, rational mode of behavioral therapy, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but comparatively to that, um, Dr. Aaron Beck, uh, who developed cognitive therapy, stated philosoph the philosophical origins of cognitive therapy can be traced back to the Stoic philosophers. Again, just showing that connection to uh, Stoicism from uh, the Greeks from that time period. Now, paralleling that, um, there was an interest in observation of human experience in India, right, following the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha. And according to the tradition, at some point, uh, Shakyamuni Buddha became a serious student of meditation and ph philosophical traditions that were practiced in the Indian subcontinent. Right? Uh, at that point, you know, numerous techniques of, of yoga, attention training, behavioral change methods were developed throughout the region within a centuries old pre-scientific tradition that related to spiritual scriptures. You know, and the reason why this is is uh, important in this discussion is that it's creating this link between um, the underpinnings of uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and other psychotherapeutic approaches, um, along with Buddhism. So, furthermore, here it states that uh, Shakyamuni Buddha mastered these methods and then proceeded to develop and 
innovative technology for training, the mind for liberation and self -hunting. In addition, it's the Buddha's approach depended upon individual practices and pragmatic results. Now, this, this uh, part here is also uh, linking to um, cognitive behavioral therapy in particular in the sense that uh, when, you, when you're looking at, at change or trying to create a desire for change, that, that does start with the individual, you know, that you yourself uh, can, can plant a seed for change or, or, or use skillful means to try to elicit a change, but to physically do change or to actually put the, the work in that's uh, to the individual. So here we're going to transition from the origin to um, the, the lenses. So, uh, like I stated previously, you know, for the purpose of this discussion, the Buddhist, Buddhist psychology is used referring to both tradition of psychological techniques and applied philosophy of mind that have been used within Buddhism uh, to help people liberate themselves from suffering. Now, the term suffering is something I want to get into a little later, but um, I'll just leave it here you know, at this point. <clears throat> Uh, Buddhism uh, can provide a system for understanding human experience with the focus on personal direct observation of sensory information, the mind and mental objects such as thoughts, ideas and states of mind. You know, similar to cognitive uh, behavioral therapy, uh, the focus is uh, pretty much the same. So now looking at the cognitive behavioral lens, uh, and this is more so just uh, discussing Cognitive, cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT in terms of um, why it's uh, used and compared to Buddhism. So um, here, uh, Church states that rather than consistent of a single unified model of mental functioning, the term CBT represents a community of empirically supported treatments, which currently are recognized as the gold standard approach to psychotherapy in terms of efficacy research. This recognition appears to be due to the emphasis within CBT on scientific methods and evidence-based practices. Uh, this, that part is uh, particularly important uh, when it comes to working with uh, private insurance companies. You know, they typically only pay for evidence-based work or work that they can um, substantiate. Uh, so, uh, examples of traditional cognitive behavioral approaches include rational emotive behavioral therapy with Dr. Albert Ellis, cognitive therapy with Dr. Aaron Beck, and um, the, the, the other two here you might not be as familiar with, but it's uh, rational behavior therapy, Dr. Maxi Maltzby, and rational living therapy, Dr. Aldo Pucci. Uh, I trained under Dr. Aldo Pucci in rational living therapy, and uh, uh, Dr. Pucci trained under Dr. Maxi Mosby, and Dr. Mosby trained under Dr. Ellis. Um, they all have different variations to their approach, um, and I do want to talk about the, the term rational as well. Uh, but actually, I'll talk about it now. Uh, so when, when, when you look at cognitive behavioral therapy, and you look at the, you, you hear a lot of um, the, the, the term rational thinking. Uh, the term rational is, um, I think, sometimes misunderstood in the sense that uh, they view it from an intellectual or logical standpoint, where, in my opinion, when Ellis developed the, or came up with the term and when Mosby further uh, used the term, uh, they viewed it as more of an interconnectedness of uh, the, the, the mental, physical, and emotional self. Um, in other words, that we, we all all units work as one, and uh, even though they're separate, they, they still uh, work together. Uh, and that the the term rational to them equated to optimal health. Um, <clears throat> now, examples of examples of newer CBT approaches include acceptance and commitment therapy with Dr. Stephen Hayes, compassion focused therapy with Dr. Paul Gilbert, and dialectical behavioral therapy. DBT, Dr. Marsha Lane now. Okay, now I want to uh, get into suffering from both perspectives. So this is what I wanted to talk about suffering uh, in terms of how are we defining the uh, word. So uh, from uh, Church's uh, book, Church, Silverstein and Pulse, 
their their book is um, uh, um, Buddhism and Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, uh, and but the book is from a is for the clinician. So you know the wording, in my opinion, is geared towards the therapist, not so much someone who uh, is a is a Buddhist. So the the term here, the way that it's worded, uh, may sound slightly different. Uh, but they they do uh, focus on the Four Noble Truths in terms of uh, describing suffering. And uh, one of the things there is the First Noble Truth suggests that every aspect of life will involve some element of dissatisfaction, some imbalance, and some degree of pain. Uh, and then uh, Rahula described about while the translation of dukkha isn't, as suffering isn't exactly incorrect, it's incomplete. Uh, the root of the word represents the feeling of riding in a wagon uh, with one of the wheels that's out of balance. A complete definition of dukkha is more expansive and would include descriptors such as imperfect, impermanent, frustrating, and perhaps fundamentally and ultimately unsatisfying. Now, ironically enough, uh, with a lot of uh, the work that I've done over the years, these uh, previously mentioned words is something I would hear often uh, at some point in sessions with people, you know, and when you think about why, because, well, when you think about <clears throat> why does somebody come to the therapy, you know, num the number one thing that we uh, say is kind of uh, what brings you here today? And they say, well, you know, more times than not, it's because of somebody else. And, um, but when they start doing the work or they start exploring, start examining things, these um, words here start to pop up. You know, and, it, and it really makes you wonder in terms of um, what's really at the root of all of it, uh, which brings me to the next part. The essence of the first noble truth in life is that life is difficult and in several different ways, you know, there's root desires, anger, and ignorance. And I, think up to this point i've yet to work with someone who at its root the issue wasn't surrounding some form of desire anger or ignorance uh in any combination or individually now looking at suffering from a cognitive behavioral uh, perspective i'm uh, using coochie's rational living therapy uh again one because i trained on them directly and two I feel it's pretty easily digestible in terms of explaining uh, the ABCs. Uh, so here, whenever a person with a healthy, normal brain says an emotional feeling or engages in a behavior, three things happen, and we call this the ABCs of emotions. And I should note that the the ABCs, the way I, I view it, is is much like a uh, much like a template. And once you practice the template enough you no longer need the template because it becomes a habit. Uh, anyway, first, we are aware of something. Right? So the A and the ABCs is uh, awareness. In other words, we see something, we hear something, or use our senses in some way to notice a situation, an event, or a condition. Uh, after we are aware of something, our brain automatically begins to think or believe something about what we are aware of. This is the B of the ABCs. And this is also the, uh, the meat and potatoes of uh, the ABCs. Also, because the way that our brain works, we will think one of three different ways about this thing we are aware of, either positively, neutrally, or negatively. Right, so an example of a positive thought is this is a good thing. An example of a negative thought is this is a bad thing. And an example of a neutral thought is this is not a, a good or bad thing, or it doesn't much matter to me. Okay. And then the way that we think about what we are aware of then tells our brain how to make the rest of our body feel and tell our body how to act. So we call that reaction the emotional consequence. Um, and I guess just to, to add, uh, well, actually, I'll continue this and then I'll add it later. Uh, so we call it the emotional consequence. That's the C of the ABCs. So a positive thought causes our body to feel a positive feeling happy or excited, negative thoughts cause negative feelings, depression, anxiety, or anger, and neutral thoughts cause neutral feelings, calm. I mean, again, these are um, basically um, 
constructs right that that are that are put in place to help convey a certain idea right and and, and part of that idea is the the bottom part here about irrational beliefs and cognitive distortions which is the b of the abcs is uh when, when you look at you know how the brain works a lot of um the work from dr Maltzby, uh did focus on the brain you know and um we don't have time to get into that but just to i guess kind of make a long story short with that we look at three areas that uh that um are involved in creating thought all right, so one is observational learning, uh, two is classical conditioning, and three is uh, operant conditioning. <clears throat> and one of the things that uh, most be said about classical conditioning for those familiar with Pavlov's dogs is that we as humans are not emotionally disturbed by, th uh, no, sorry, that's uh, something else. But <laughs> what he said was, um, uh, words are the human as the bell was the Pavlov's dogs, All right? And I'll get into that a little later. Now we're looking at commonalities between the two. Like I said, it was three main ones. Uh, one is to focus on empiricism, practicality, uh, observation. Um, and the uh, second one is to view a self as, as a construct. So self versus no self versus uh, observational learning, classical condition, and operant conditioning. So again, um, um, basically, when you look at the self versus no self versus the other three that I mentioned, you look at when someone has an uh, an idea uh, in terms of who who they are, how they identify themselves uh, from a cognitive behavioral perspective. You know, they're saying that the, that this stems from things that well, observational learning when you was younger classical condition in terms of how you attach feelings to words and operant conditioning in terms of how things were either reinforced or punished right those, those are things that created thoughts and then there are factors that can uh, increase thoughts such as uh, desirability repetition emotional insight things of that nature and uh, the third area here regarding commonality uh, between uh, buddhism and cbt is understanding current events or behaviors as a result to precipitate causal factors so we're looking at the awareness piece the a of the abcs um and then getting into like the underlying assumptions so addressing suffering we're looking at the uh for for buddhism uh terse, you know, they, they they focus a lot on the noble eightfold path um i like the six perfections um, but in either case, these are tools um, in their wording to address this idea of suffering or um, uh, being being able to to actualize um, a way of helping others. Right? Uh, now, again, this is a very brief presentation on this, and um, I feel uh, Machin Sensei has uh, discussed both of these areas pretty thoroughly and continues to do so. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that. More so, I was going to discuss uh, CBT and the ABC model uh, with one of the handouts that um, was attached. So when uh, looking at addressing, but I want to connect it to the two as well. Uh, so when looking at uh, addressing su suffering from a cognitive behavioral perspective, you know, we're looking at the ABC model. We're looking at underlying assumptions, uh, cognitive distortions, dispute and irrational thoughts, and rational replacement thoughts. Uh, again, a lot of these are, are, are terms to help people understand certain concepts, but in my opinion, they're not anything to hold on to because once you do, I think you lose sight of the ultimate goal of like, what you're there for. Um, I mean, in terms of the therapist, not so much the client. Uh, the underlying assumptions is basically, uh, well, I'm going to go through each, each of these with the example. Um, so actually, let me do that. So I'm going to pause the um, presentation there. Uh, so again, with the ABCs of emotions, um, in this example here, uh, it, the, the situation is the same, right? And as I mentioned previously, we're looking at positive, neutral, and 
negative. So uh, here, two individuals are dating, and one person says to the other, I don't want to see you again. Okay. Now, here's an example of how he can view this in a positive way. Right. So we look at, well, what was his thought or belief? And he says, wow, this is my chance to break up with her. I've been wanting to date another girl for a long time, but didn't want Susie to be upset. Now she won't be. Right. So now the emotional consequence is basically what do you, uh, you know, how do you emotionally feel about it? But what do you say and what, what do you do? And what he says is, well, it's been nice knowing you. Good luck with everything. Right. So that's positive. He viewed what, you know, she said. So here's a neutral way to view it. She says, again, I don't want to see you again. And he thinks to himself, I sure wish Susie would change her mind because I really like her. I will miss her, but my life isn't over. I can be happy without her, and I'll probably find another girl someday. This is unfortunate, not terrible. So in terms of an emotional consequence, he says, I would like to see if we can work things out, but if not, we'll both be okay. Right. And then there's a negative view. Same situation. She says, I don't want to see you again. He says, or uh, thinks to himself, I can't let Susie break up with me because I am nothing without her. I won't be able to take living without her because I need her desperately. This is a terrible thing she's trying to do, and I must beg her to reconsider. Right. And what does he say as a result? Please don't break up with me. I'm begging you. I'll do anything you want. Just stay with me. Right. So the part that we're concerned with here is the uh, negative. Well, not that's the part that we're concerned with. Typically, when a person comes to therapy, they don't necessarily say, uh, my problem is this positive feeling or this neutral feeling. Typically, they, they come because of this type of feeling, but they may not know, you know how to categorize it. So uh, in this example here, you look at, well, well, we, we use something that would be called the uh, downward arrow technique. Right? So basically what you're trying to do is get to the underlying assumption. So a way of doing that is, is asking uh, him something along the lines of, um, well, what's the worst thing about that? Right? Or how is that a problem for you? Right? And then he's going to say whatever he's going to say. And then after that, your next uh, question is going to be, well, what does that mean? Right? Or how is that bad? Right? And then he's going to respond and say whatever he's going to say. And then you're going to say, well, where's the evidence? Right? What you're trying to do is get to to see well, what is it that you really believe about the situation. Right? And one of the things with these rational approaches is that they have these what's called irrational uh, uh, questions to ask. And uh, that, that can let you know if the way that you're thinking is aligning with this optimal health idea. And uh, one of the questions is, is my thinking based on an observable fact? Right. So if he says that she breaks up with me, I'm nothing without her. You know, how, you know, like, again, to help me understand how, how are you nothing? Uh, you know, like, well, what, what does that mean you know, in terms of defining it um, and taking it from there? Again, we're just trying to save time here by going through this. Uh, and saying I won't be able to take living without her. So one of the things we, we're, we're very um, uh, focused on in, in uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is the, like camera checks of perception. So if someone has a thought that I can't live without this person, well, in what ways you know are they attached to you in some way that if they were to remove themselves that you would no longer you know uh, live, you know you no longer be be breathing, you know. Well, what is it that you actually believe about this, right? So at the same time, I'll just skip to what we're, what, uh, we're looking at irrational um, beliefs and cognitive uh, distortions. So one of the things in this case that would be important to mention would be uh, the cognitive distortion of confusing needing and wanting. Uh, and, and the reason why that's um, an issue is because when you Again, looking at observable facts in terms of what is a need, a need would be something that if you went without it, that you would cease to exist over a period of time, such as food, water, uh, you know, shelter, warmth, thing, things of that nature. But the, the problem is, is when you confuse a, a want with a need, then you act as if 
it will cease to exist uh, by going without it. And that's kind of where that, that journal um, thought process uh, when when, when uh, working with someone. Uh, and it, what's that one say? This is a terrible thing she's trying to do. I must beg her to reconsider. The must is the other issue in terms of um, acting as if uh, this 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 should happen. Right? Yeah, must and should fall in the same category. Right? Uh, but to tie this all together, let me stop sharing and go back to the um, presentation. So uh, yeah, again, getting, getting back to um, the Noble Eightfold Path and the six perfections and this ABC model, you know, for, for me, the uh, connection uh, seems pretty, um, pretty clear if you as the therapist are, are you know, truly helping the uh, person to, if, if you're objective for, for one in terms of um, looking at what is it that's really a problem for them. You know, if it's a, a lot of times people will say, well, X, Y, and Z is a problem. And one of the things that I would like to focus on is making a clear distinction between um, a means to achieving a goal with the goal itself. And part of the reason for that is that you know the goal is not not necessarily the means to achieving the goal is not what you want but a lot of people confuse that with the goal itself um and i can give a quick example on that um I could, well actually we're not time for that example so um what i found interesting uh in terms of the the abc model and looking at the six perfections and the noble eightfold path is um from doing a daily service you know when, when you look at the these um methods you know address desires anger and ignorance right and when you look at song Iman, you know that's your you, you repent those those um those three and you, you you basically you know are acknowledging this um this uh negative uh karma that's that's been in existence you know and when you look at therapy it's like for some people it takes a long time just for them to acknowledge it and i feel that by by doing so you know in in the way that, that we do um it gets us there a lot faster you know because we already accept it you know, um when you think about how the brain works it either accepts some a, a thought or is going to reject the thought so it's kind of built into the daily service that you accept it you know and then Kaika Ogi, you, you, you're basically committing to, um, you know, understanding the uh, Dharma. And um, and I feel that the um, the Heart Sutra, you know, within itself would be what um, an ABC model would consider a uh, rational replacement thought. Now, a rational replacement thought from a cognitive behavioral uh, lens is a thought that basically answers yes to those three questions in terms of uh, being based on an object, um, observable fact, helping you to feel the way that you want to feel, and aligning with your goals. Um, one of the key things too with goals is that, like I said, you got to make sure that the the goal is is aligning with something that's um, uh, helpful, not only for that person but but for others. And so that's what I feel like. When I look at goals, the goals always are going to align with the six perfections, and I and I, I just seem to always fall in that category with that. Um, and it's not something I started out doing, but I kind of just found myself doing that. Um, so for me, they seem to go hand in hand when uh, working in, together. Um, but I feel like the heart suture itself is a is a pretty solid rational replacement thought. Um, I mean, it's not a rational place of thought, but I think it's a healthy um, way to to practice. And again, from um, what I spoke about earlier in terms of Buddhism and cognitive behavioral therapies, you know, the the major piece is the individual work that 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 we put in. You know, and and it's not done for for uh, selfish reasons. You know, like I don't I don't do this for myself. I do it for for others. You know, um, 
So that that's um, basically my uh, presentation. And in terms of a conclusion, right, in terms of a conclusion, both Buddhist psychology and CBT aim to observe, question, and alleviate experience of suffering by providing a clearer understanding of reality and creating an effective context to cultivate new approaches to one's struggle and personal development. Both Buddhist psychology and CBT have accessible and powerful contributions to offer one another in the pursuit of shared aims and functions. Uh, basically what I was saying before, um, and I just feel like that was a good ending to this topic. So uh, I'm gonna stop sharing and then if anyone had any questions or concerns, feel free to discuss. Um, Shima uh, Sensei, do you have any comments that you would like to make? Thank you. Uh, it, it, it is interesting you mentioned the name of the Puton Rinpoche and the Over Mirrors translation about the teaching of Buddha. And Puton is 14 centuries, they are historians of Tibet. And the Oba Mira uh, was uh, the very uh, good scholar uh, under the Cherubatsky, uh, Russia. And uh, Oba Mira died young, but he is very interesting and uh, uh, maybe uh, <clears throat> very scholar to identify what what happened in Tibet between you know uh, Chinese. Mahayana version and uh, uh, Indian scholar uh, Kamarashira. And uh, these debates are very famous, and uh, he uh, picked up such subject. And uh, so far as concerns about uh, six perfections, uh, 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 par six parameters uh, in a Buddhist uh, uh, practice, I think uh, Kamarashira, uh, who debated against uh, Mahayana version, and, from China, he he insisted the balanced teaching between uh, wisdom and compassion. And wisdom is a prajna parameter, and compassion includes five perfections. And uh, so this balance is the most important and practice emphasized. So that is my feeling, uh, what I understand. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sensei. Um, I, since we don't have a lot of time, I'm going to skip any comments just to say I think that was a nice, nice presentation. You brought things together very well. Thank you very much.